I'm Jeff Getman with American Purpose. Uh, we are keenly interested in reform at home. And as they say, you can't be something with nothing. And Catherine, our principal guest of honor, has things and ideas and real hard and interesting creative work. I'm not going to say any more because you can hear a lot more about that soon from her, from our moderator, Jim Glassman, and our conversation partner, Larry Diamond. We're going to have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern. Jim Glassman is a friend. He's a brilliant moderator. He's been at AEI and hosted his own television programs. He's been under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and a number of other very important, interesting things. Jim, thank you for managing and leading the conversation today. It's your show and it's over to you. Thank you, Jeff. And it's a, a pleasure to be with you and thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, so let me just very briefly introduce uh, Catherine and Professor Diamond. So uh, Catherine Gale is a, a business leader, a former CEO, of a major food manufacturer who for the last several years has devoted herself to democracy reform, specifically as the pioneer of final five voting, which you're gonna hear a lot more about uh, today. She's the chair of the Institute for Political Innovation. And Larry Diamond, who needs no introduction, is a professor at Stanford. He's, the, I just wanna get this straight here, the Mossbacker Senior Fellow in Global Democracy, author of many books, and probably the top uh, democracy scholar in the United States, probably in the world today. So we're just very pleased to have Larry here. I'm going to just start with Catherine immediately. Uh, and just on a personal note, I've been involved in the democracy reform effort ever since 2015. And um, I have never come across a leader. Uh, who had a better strategic grasp on what the problem is and what the potential solution is. So let me just start by asking you, Catherine, what is the problem? It is a great question. Um, and there are lots of candidates for the problem. So let me just tell a story uh, to start with so we can get at the root cause. Um, I recently spoke to the White House Fellows Organization, and I had the honor of following uh, Representative Liz Cheney, who gave the, the morning keynote. And one of the things she said in response to a question, you know, what should people tell their friends? Um, what, what does Representative Cheney want her everybody's friends to know? And she responded saying that the attendees should tell all of their friends that elections really matter. And I was then in the very difficult position of coming right after Representative Cheney and starting off by needing to correct her. Because as I told them, and I say today, that the reason I was there and I'm there today is because the truth is that most elections don't matter whatsoever at all. Here's the example. So on August 16th of 22, uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Congressman Woman Cheney had their party primaries in their path to reelection or, or not. And at the end of that day on August 16th, we knew everybody in America who the representative from Wyoming was going to be. And it was not going to be Liz Cheney. It was going to be her competitor who won that Republican primary. And at the end of the day in Alaska, we didn't know who was going to be the next senator from the state of Alaska. And that's because in Alaska, general elections matter. And in Wyoming, general elections don't matter at all. This is a problem writ large, which is to say that most winners in this country are chosen months before November voters show up at the polls. In 2022, we really should have had a big headline on September 13th, because that was the date of our country's last party primaries. And at that point, 
83% of the U.S. House had been determined and approximately 65% of the U.S. Senate had been determined because 80, because 83% of the House seats and 60% of the U.S. Senate seats are safe for one party or the other. So whoever wins the Republican primary in a red district or red state is guaranteed to win in November. And whoever wins the blue in the Democratic district or state is guaranteed to win in November, which means November voters don't matter at all. And who does matter? That's another interesting question. At this same date, September 13th, when those majorities, vast majorities of the House and Senate had already been chosen, who had participated? The answer, according to great research by Unite America, is 8% of the voting citizens in this country had participated in choosing the majority of the House and Senate. So all those people showing up in November in our democracy, they're essentially participating in really almost a farce because their votes are gonna make no difference. And here's the thing, that's terribly undemocratic. I mean, it sounds unfair. It sounds against everything we believe in in this country, but it's even worse than being undemocratic. It is the reason, the primary reason why we don't get any results in the public interest. Because when the winners are chosen by 8% of people and they're chosen here and here, which is the party primary voters, those are the only people that these elected officials can afford to answer to because they are the bosses. They're the ones that gave these elected officials their jobs. And while we might think that these two sides, this 8%, this 8% really have nothing in common with each other, they're actually very much almost identical, I would say, in one wildly consequential way. And that is that they're both characterized by what political scientists call negative partisanship. That means that they are these voters are more motivated by how much they hate the other side and want them to fail than they are by allegiance to their party's own ideals and policy platforms. So they are invested in the people they represent, making sure that the other side fails and they prefer, and therefore their electeds prefer, to uh, gridlock, grandstanding, anything to respond to those electorates rather than to do the hard work of legislating. So that's the core. The people who we have, most of them are not permitted by their bosses to deal powerfully with the complex trade-offs in our difficult issues. Because if they do, they'll lose their next election. So, so you define the problem and the result of the problem is, as you say, they don't meet our challenges. No, no, one, no one really bothers to solve the problems or to innovate because if they did that, they would lose in the primaries. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And we'll look at it. I'll, I'll say it a little bit um, more in detail. So look, if we had easy problems to solve, even our crummy system would be able to do that, right? Our problems, be they immigration, healthcare, national security, debt deficit, climate change, anything that people are worried about, they're complicated. And to solve them, you have to deal with trade-offs. It's not all win-win. You give something, you know, you lose something. And so dealing with the complexity of those trade-offs requires people to take certain actions, which is if we were gonna solve these, you'd have to have people in the legislature who could reach across the aisle, who could innovate, who could have discussions, trying to figure out a way forward and then they could negotiate. They would be able to make a deal and then they'd be able to vote yes on that consensus bipartisan deal from both sides. But right now, what happens is not only are the people who answer only to party primary voters unable to engage in those actions, let's just say they did, they can't vote yes on the solution. I'll use an example. If we had a deal on the budget, and this issue is coming up because of the related but 
I won't get it, but the debt ceiling crisis, you know, there, we have this problem of what should we be spending? If you enacted the Simpson Bowles, um, you know, debt deficit plan that, uh, that took place back in the Obama administration, and it was a bipartisan consensus on how to, how to solve our national crisis. If you enacted that, it included both some benefit decrease and some tax increase. And the people who made it said in their preamble, they actually said something like, um, none of us on this committee agree with everything in here, but we agree that the sum is the best way forward for the country. But when you have that kind of deal, Republicans can't vote on anything that has $1 of tax increase, and Democrats can't vote yes on anything that has $1 of benefit decrease. So the consensus solutions are dead on arrival on both sides. And by and the, so the solution that we have to look for is what would make our legislators in, able to engage in the kinds of activities that would solve complex problems and able to vote yes on those solutions. And the answer goes to what I brought up earlier, which is we have to make sure no winners are chosen until November. And that's where the key is gonna be. Oh, uh, Jim, I can't hear you. You're on mute. But it was brilliant. <laughs> it was brilliant. Um, so you want to change the incentives of the elected officials so that they look to a different electorate. So, uh, so tell us about the specifics of the solution. How do you get the incentives to change? Mm -hmm. But we, there's something, there's a new movement, um, and I uh, named it a little bit ago, Final Five Voting. So it is the umbrella term that encompasses the combination of two changes to our election system. Here's what they are. The first thing we do under Final Five Voting is we eliminate party primaries. And instead, we implement a single preliminary round, an open preliminary round where everybody runs on the same ballot and all the voters participate on the same ballot. There's not one Republican primary, one Democrat primary. Everybody picks their favorite out of all the candidates entered, then polls close, you count the votes, and we will advance the top five finishers from the open preliminary round to the general election. Now, and that's regardless of party, by the way. So let's say it's a red district. You could easily have three of those advanced being Republicans. You can have any number advancing. And we don't know who's won after this open preliminary round. So now between the end of the preliminary round, which would take place the same day as that state's party primaries have, unless they change it. Then in the between then and the general election, we benefit from this dynamic, diverse competition of candidates, ideas, constituencies, innovations, five people debating, intra-party competition between Republicans, new, new people calling out the incumbent for what they haven't gotten done. There's an accountability in there. Then when we get to the general election, the second change we make is we eliminate plurality voting. That's a rule where in this country, we let people win elections when they have the most votes, but they don't necessarily have a majority. So we wouldn't want, now that we have this great competition, we wouldn't want one of these five candidates to accidentally win with 21% of the vote. I mean, that would not be democratic, but it also wouldn't be helpful. They wouldn't have the broadest support. So we use a process of instant runoffs in order to find out which of these five has the greatest support from the most number of voters. Candidates or voters simply rank the five candidates in their order of preference. And when the polls close, we use those ranked ballots to, to narrow the five to the final two, at which point majority wins. You can think of instant runoffs as being exactly like a series of physical runoffs, but instead of having to keep coming back for another election, you just cast all your votes at once using that ranked ballot. So Catherine, I'm going to 
bring Larry in and then we'll come back to you. But I do want to say one thing, which is this is not merely a theory. Uh, this actually has taken place in a slightly different form, final four voting in Alaska on November 8th. And it just won a, a ballot initiative in Nevada, 53 to 47, final five voting. But we're going to talk about that in a second. I just want to bring, uh, I just want to bring Larry in. So, Larry, good to see you. It's an honor um, to be here with you, Larry. So, so, so Larry, in, in October, CNN asked 12 experts how to repair America's broken democracy. And the headline on your contrib contribution was eliminate the party primary. So we're seeing a, a developing consensus on this subject. But I actually wanted to ask you kind of a more of a, a, a history question which is why now, why has this gridlock, this partisan gridlock that we all realize is the big problem, why has it occurred now? I mean, in George W. Bush's first term, we had a huge bipartisan majority for Medicare Part D and for No Child Left Behind, although that didn't work out uh, a little bit later, and not to mention national security. So, so what's, what's going on right now that's changed things? Well, um, I think uh, social media has had a huge impact, Jim, uh, in deepening the polarization of our politics. We've talked about this uh, in other sessions. I think politics has become a tribal uh, identity game dominated by extreme partisans of those ide uh, uh, ideas and ideologies and most importantly, identities uh, in ways that, you know, Frank has um, tried to alert us to in much of his writing, including his most recent book. And um, uh, as the extremes with their deep grievances and their higher motivation to turn out in party primaries have come more and more to dominate um, the process and as party organizations have been weakened and enervated uh, in the process, um, beginning really with the Newt, Newt Gingrich revolution in the 90s and his mobilization of more extreme candidates and then the Tea Party, uh, Catherine does a beautiful job of tracing this um, uh, evolution uh, in her book with um, Michael Porter, uh, the politics industry, we've we've fallen into this trap where um, the we have uncompetitive uh, congressional districts because of gerrymandering. We have uncompetitive congressional districts in states because of residential um, patterns and the great sorting and. <clears throat> uh, the cultural, you know, uh, polarization and other things we can we can talk about, and unless we completely shake up the current partisan basis of competition and polarization, and the most perverse element of this, which is the magic eight percent that can uh, elect. Uh, a congressman or senator or governor in a non-competitive state, uh, we're down this rat hole. Uh, and then the further you go down this rat hole of political polarization, the more the other side reacts to it, the less get, gets done in Congress, the more people get disillusioned with democracy uh, as it functions in the United States or pretends to, uh, and uh, then the more polarized we get. And you're seeing it now on the Democratic side with the targeting uh, in primaries of, of moderates. Uh, and people respond to incentives. If we change this incentive structure in the way uh, that Catherine has articulated, we'll get a different kind of politics. So, so Larry, so you, you agree with Catherine that the kind of people who vote in party primaries are, are different or they're a slice of the, the general election voters. The fact that I agree with Catherine about that is not 
the least bit interesting as an insight or headline from this session because it's beyond dispute it's a it's a social it's a it, it's an indisputable social science reality we've got the data to show that um party primaries particularly on the republican side are dominated by an unrepresentative now maga leaning but certainly more right leaning um a highly motivated um, uh, share of the electorate. And this has become not quite as true, but more and more true on the Democratic side of primaries. And it's logical if you think about it. It takes effort to turn out to vote. Party primaries happen early in the year, um, often by, you know, April, May, June, midsummer at the latest, only a few take place uh, around Labor Day. And so um, it makes sense that the people who are most highly motivated, who are following it the most, would be most likely to vote. And the people who are most highly motivated are the ones who tend to be the most angry or the most engaged, have the most defined ideological and political views. and they're not all uh, you know leaning toward the extremes i think most people on this call probably kind of lean toward the creative center and they probably vote in primaries but you know um people who lean toward creative non-polarizing solutions are just outvoted in the primaries it's just a statistical fact what I think may be more noteworthy is that I agree with Catherine on the solution. Um, good. And I so um, I, I actually you mentioned the the creative center and I just want to go back to Catherine on this. Um, I was very interested to see that the big donors in Nevada included both contributors to Democrats and contributors to Republicans. Um, so does final five voting tend to elect moderates or does it tend to elect Democrats or, I mean, is this, is this kind of a, a, a plot to elect a certain kind of person? Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, well, actually, if you were skewing an election system to elect one kind of ideology, artificially, then I think there would be something, you know, wrong with that. If we're having an election system that uh, wants to elect quality candidates, then that's another thing. But let me uh, answer the important part of your question. So final five voting elects candidates, the candidate who appeals to the greatest number of November general election voters in that district or state. If the greatest number of general election voters want to elect a centrist, they will elect them. But if they want to elect someone else, then they get to elect someone else. Here's an example. So in Alaska, remember I said that on the day of Senator Murkowski, the incumbent's primary, she um, it was the preliminary round now because they have final four voting. On that day, we didn't know who had won there. She advanced to the general election with another Republican candidate named Kelly Shabaka. And as many here will know, uh, President Trump opposed Lisa Murkowski because she had voted to impeach him and other reasons. And he endorsed and supported Kelly Shabaka, the Republican challenger. Final five voting did not give a, an advantage to Senator Murkowski, who later went, did go on to win. What it did is say, how about for once we let the general election voters of this state choose who represents them instead of the party primary choose. So under a party primary system, it would have been highly likely, pretty much guaranteed that Senator Murkowski would have lost to the Trump supported challenger, Kelly Shabaka. But in the general election, nothing was guaranteed. And if that general electorate wanted Kelly Shabaka, they would have elected her. They could have had who they wanted. So this is the let's give the November voters who they want prize. The truth is that 
I do believe, and the theory suggests that when we let November voters decide, they will prioritize certain qualities and it in our representatives that have to do with actually solving problems. And you'll create a path to reelection for people who deal in the complexities and trade-offs in a way that you can't create in the primaries. So if the theory works, and we're seeing some results in Alaska, which we can talk about that suggest that it does change behavior in Congress, then, uh, then it will elect problem-solving candidates, but it won't elect a certain you know, ideology. And Alaska elected a governor who was supported by Donald Trump at the same right. time. And they, and they also elected a Democrat to their, you know, almost Senate-like House seat. They only have one, so it represents the entire state. And she is, for example, Mary Peltola. She was elected as a Democrat, but she is governing in a way that means she knows she was elected with more independent and Republican votes than Democratic votes. So she kept... Her, the Republican chief of staff of her predecessor. She just hired one of her Republican opponents in that race to be the head of her home office in Alaska for legislative affairs. She is definitely governing in a way that responds to her whole, um, to her whole electorate. And let me say one other thing. Final five voting is not designed to change who wins elections. It's designed to change what winners do when they're doing the work of legislating. So here's a good way of putting it. If the fairy godmother came down right now and said, the brilliant Larry Diamond and Francis Fukuyama, another brilliant uh, face in this Zoom, could choose today all the perfect people to populate the US House and Senate but we would keep their next election rules exactly the same as they are today. Or choice B, we could keep all the same people, but change their election rules to final five voting, their next re-election. Which one would result in better policy? I would take B, all the same people with different incentives, different accountabilities accountable to November election voters in their next election, and we get different results. Um, okay, so... I just want to remind everyone that there that we will be taking questions. So easiest thing to put them just put them in chat. Actually, some interesting stuff in chat as well. Um, Larry made reference to uh, Catherine's uh, book with Michael Porter, "The Politics Industry," two thousand twenty, uh, published by Harvard uh, Business Review Press. And there was someone makes a reference to Lee Drutman's book. Um, so also I have a question here, interesting question I'm gonna read from Roy Vela. Uh, isn't the key question, how do we get there from here? That is incumbents <clears throat> tend not to vote to change their interests, uh, whether it's election reform or anything else. So how do you, how do you get there? Uh, so Catherine, why don't you maybe talk about Nevada or other states and figure out how we do get there? Yes, so about half the states in this country have ballot initiative processes, so direct democracy processes where you can put a question to the voters, usually on the November ballot, where if usually a majority of voters choose it, then it goes into effect. So that's often the way that reforms that you know affect incumbents can take place because you go directly to the citizens. So that's what happened in Alaska when they passed final four voting in 2020. And that's what happened this year in Nevada in 2022 when they passed final five voting. We have campaigns in uh, legislative states also, uh, chief among them Wisconsin, which has been going on. I co-founded that back in 2017 with other Wisconsin business people. And we're making great progress, but the, but most of these are going to happen through ballot initiative um, in the early stages. And it's possible we've proven it. And here's the thing that I really like about final five voting: we don't have to pass it in a ton of states to begin to see a difference in how Congress works. Our stated goal is five states with final five voting by 2025. So we'd pass the next states in the in November 2024. And here's what would happen. Then you would have 10 senators 
who in their next elections know that they are going to have serious competition in their general election, probably from five, you know, can't from four other candidates, and they're going to be accountable to general election voters and not their party primary voters. So they now form what I think of as a bench off of whom can come the gang of six, the gang of eight, the gang of four, to create that bipartisan negotiating fulcrum with other people who sometimes come into those gangs that are already, you know, bucking that partisan stranglehold in Congress. And using that, uh, with that, you would deny in a hundred person Senate, either party this complete pro, you know, unified party, we are here and you are here, you have a problem solving fulcrum in the middle and you can start to see change beginning in 2025 by changing the incentives for only a few. Good, let me, let me bring- What do you think bring... about that, Larry? Actually, I've always wanted to talk to you more about that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, the most important thing I wanna say is that um, uh, I think that politicians respond to incentives. You're right that they don't want to uh, change the rules on their own. And they'll have to be, the rules will have to be forced on them by the people. Uh, but once the rules are changed, um, they'll adapt uh, just fine. And I think many of them will be liberated uh, to uh, behave in a way that's more creative and patriotic and maybe ultimately more satisfying to them because uh, they can be Americans again and not just Republicans and Democrats again. There's one other thing I wanted to add um, that, about the process, about the question you asked, Jim, that um, leaves me a little bit ambivalent. I mean, basically happy and grateful, but a little bit ambivalent. So um, I think in the next six months, Minnesota is going to become the first state uh, to adopt not the form of ranked choice voting that Catherine is talking about with nonpartisan primaries, but the kind that Maine adopted, just kind of garden variety ranked choice voting, ranked choice voting in the party primaries, ranked choice voting in the general election. I much prefer final five voting, but I think anything is an improvement over what we've got now. The thing that's leaving me, um, well, hopeful that we're gonna get another state to adopt ranked choice voting, but ambivalent as well, is that this is going to be adopted on a straight line party vote uh, in the Minnesota state legislature, and then signed by the Minnesota Democratic governor. And, you know, and there's no choice because Minnesota doesn't have the voter initiative option that Nevada has, Alaska, and so on. So anytime we can break beyond the partisan lens here to push for this as a reform to improve American democracy and not just as a partisan initiative, it's obviously better. You know, uh, Catherine makes the point that in Nevada, the parties were unified, unified in opposition to final five voting. I mean, the, the Democratic establishment, the, the governor, both senators the were Harry opposed Reed to it. Yeah, yeah, the Harry Reid machine. Um, so, and but, the Republicans. And the Republicans. So this is not some sort of uh, Democratic plot, but I think there's, there's, there's certainly some people think that it may be. I, so, so Larry, you bring up the, the issue of uh, ranked choice voting. And so let me just turn to Catherine, because, you know, there's been a lot of talk about ranked choice voting and a kind of something that's like ranked choice voting as part of final five voting. Uh, what do you think of ranked choice voting? What's the difference? Well, this one's a little tough because I break with virtually the entire reform community in really strongly set, you know, putting out there that I don't believe that any change 
is good change in the sense of like helpful to moving the ball forward long term. I think that now that it is clear that to really change the incentives and to make November votes matter, you have to have the combination of a single preliminary round and uh, five candidates in the general with, with then instant runoffs to, to figure out who has majority support. I don't find it helpful to continue to cheer on ranked choice voting. And again, I, I totally respect Larry and we're just on, I'm different, I'm on a different page than almost everyone. Here's why. Ranked choice voting, which is what putting instant runoffs on his own is often called, it can change who wins, but it doesn't change what winners do. So if you only still, if you still advance one Republican and one Democrat to the general election, but the seats are still safe D and safe R, the winner is still chosen when only 8% of people show up. And even if you have ranked choice voting when 8% of people show up, it's not gonna change the winners so very often that they're going to be now empowered with the agency to deal powerfully with complex changes, uh, complex trade-offs. They're not going to be, they're still gonna be elected in party primaries. November votes are still not gonna matter. And you're not going to be held accountable because the only people who are going to really compete in the general are the one Democrat, one Republican, and then a few people you've never heard of who get on the ballot through signatures. And you could change that over time, like more people could try to get on the ballot and compete in the general. But it won't change the problem, which is that November votes don't matter and people are elected there. So I think we should stop telling people that it will solve their problem. Because when they go through all the work to do that and discover that it doesn't really work, I feel like we're holding a carrot out in front of them. And I feel the same way, candidly, about campaign finance and gerrymandering, that they make us feel better, but they don't address the root cause of dysfunction. So we should just say we tried our best, but now we know what we really need to do and focus there. Yeah, rules, as as Larry was saying, I mean, rules really matter. This is one of the things that I learned from the late Peter Ackerman, and I know he's a good good friend of uh, Larry's and, and Kathleen's, or was. And you got to get the rules right. Rules really do change behavior, but they have to be, you got to get them right. Um, so Adam Wasserman asked a question, here in New Mexico, there's no ballot initiative process. Constitutional amendments have to go through the legislature. Yeah, a bunch of states are like that. Uh, there's a bill right now to establish top five and rank choice, but how do we get the legislators to vote for it? I mean, is, is that just a lost cause and that's not going to be one of your five states, Catherine? It's completely not a lost cause. We have this legislative campaign in Wisconsin that we started in 2017 and we founded it with a bipartisan group of leaders and in our kickoff event where we invited 400 of our closest friends as couples really, because we think this kind of change happens, you know, we, we protect our democracy as families in many ways. Um, at that event, we had two people stand up at one point. One was, uh, and, and they stood up together. And Andy Nunemaker said, Nunemaker said I, uh, you know, I'm here, he's tall and thin and young and he's an entrepreneur. And he said, I am a Republican and I held a fundraiser for Donald Trump in my home in 2016. I'm the only person in Wisconsin who did that. And then next to him, uh, another wonderful person lined, stood up and said, and I am one of the largest, you know, progressive funders in this state. And I am a Democrat through and through. And um, we don't agree on anything. We don't agree on much, I should say, but we agree on this. We agree on final five voting. And we're gonna continue supporting different candidates, voting for different people, being on the opposite sides of policy, but we're gonna stay united on this. And so we have built that kind of network in Wisconsin where we go person to person. I mean, this has been since 2017 and we have an extraordinary uh, executive director there named Sarah Eskrich. And we are building the knowledge because the thing is, 
people assume they don't want this. Like what Larry was saying, you might think the electeds don't want it. They think they don't, but actually their jobs, if they want to actually have agency and make things better, are much better under this. So when you take the time and you're patient, you can get people on board over time. It's just not very fast. So now we have, last year, there were like over 400 election bills in this country. And we think in Wisconsin, we had the only bipartisan election bill in the country, which was for final five voting. We had Democratic and uh, Republican co-sponsors. And we got a hearing and, you know, it's going to be introduced again. So you just do the long, hard work. So on the one hand, legislators, legislators like a system that elected them. But on the other hand, you, you always like to use the term liberated that, you know, with final five voting, you're liberated as a as a legislator to actually do the things that you that people elected you to do rather than spending all your time attacking the other party and not doing anything. Um, so and I want to ask- First of all, yeah, I want to yeah. say one thing. You mentioned this before. In Nevada, the campaign uh, had funding from across the spectrum. And that was very mm -hmm. interesting because we had some huge names who are associated in partisan ways. And they were actually invested on opposite sides of the candidate races in Nevada. So some were supporting, you know, Senator Cortez Masto, and some were supporting uh, the challenger, uh, Adam Laxalt. But they were putting their money on the same side for final five voting. Mm -hmm. And believe Good. me, I they due diligence did to make sure it's not a Trojan horse for the other side. Um, okay, so either put your questions in chat or you can also raise your hand. I want to I want to ask Larry a question and then I would love to hear from Frank as well, Frank Fukuyama. Uh, so Larry, my question is, you are, you know, you're a scholar of democracies around the world. Um, are other democratic uh, systems, parliamentary systems in most cases, having the same kind of problems that we're having? And if not, why not? Well, um, I'd say most of them are not to the same degree because they don't have our miserable electoral system. Um, you know, most European democracies use proportional representation. Uh, I think it's already been noted that uh, I'm not enthusiastic about this for the United States Congress, and I can explain a number of reasons why. I think, um, uh, Final five voting, uh, where we um, have nonpartisan primaries and then a final five rank choice round, is more likely to lead to governability, reduced polarization, creativity, creative coalitions. Uh, PR, I worry, could force people into their, you know, I, deeper into their ideological foxholes. But um, in any case, uh, in a number of European democracies, Germany is a noteworthy example. It's worked well enough. It's got moderate breaks on it. Um, and it's also led to creative coalitions, including a very creative one right now uh, between the Social Democrats, the Greens, and um, uh, the uh, the Liberal Democratic Party in uh, in Germany, um, New Zealand abandoned uh, uh, first past the post uh, a long time ago. Uh, Australia adopted um, a simpler kind of main style version of uh, rank choice voting about a century ago. I see Ben Riley's with us. He's He's from Australia and is probably the leading expert on this. I mean, you know, I would say about first past the post, what Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, said about liberal democracy in 1975, of course, he took, fortunately he turned out to be wrong about that. this. Uh, first past the post is where the world was. It's not the where, where the world is going. And most countries that have this electoral system you know, have abandoned it uh, at one time or another. I'd like to say 
one more thing, uh, Jim, very briefly. Um, I, I agree with Catherine, final five voting, uh, to my mind, um, in the form that she's articulated it would be the best type of system. And if you, if you wanna add another hour to this conversation, we could get much deeper into the arcane weeds of counting methods and so on and so forth. But um, I am a little bit more um, pluralistic uh, in what kinds of reforms um, uh, I think can move us forward. And uh, so I just have two one sentence statements to make. One is um, if Maine had had, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, the rank choice, the simple rank choice voting system they have today an extremely polarizing, regressive, uh, uh, MAGA-style governor of Maine, Paul LePage, would never have been elected and inflicted his polarizing misery on Maine for eight years. Um, and, and that would have been better for democratic governance in Maine. And the second thing is, um, there is another way around this. I think it's less preferable than final five voting and nonpartisan primaries. Catherine mentions it um, in her book uh, and I mention it in mine. And that is the perversity of having 44 states in the United States where if you lose a party primary, you can't be on the ballot in the general election. And another way around this, I think it's an inferior way, but I'm just noting it is if you get rid of the sore loser rule in these states and um, allow losers in primaries to come back and run as independents in the general election, you know, that could be another way of making progress. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just turn to uh, Francis Fukuyama, author most recently of Liberalism and Its Discontents. Uh, okay, well, thanks. Uh... So Catherine, you explain you answered the question that I would have had about you know going straight to rank choice voting without the final five. I mean that does seem to me to make uh, sense. I guess the main argument that a lot of people are going to pose is complexity. They already do this with regard to rank choice voting. I've always thought that this was a stupid argument because I actually you know Papua New Guinea, where probably half the population is not even literate switched to rank choice voting in 2006. I was actually there at the time to observe the election. And within a couple of election cycles, they figured out how to do it. So I figure if Papua New Guinea can do this, we can do this. Uh, combining top five with rank choice voting though does increase the complexity of the change substantially and getting people to see the logic of it, I think is gonna be a real challenge. I don't think it's one that can, can't be overcome, but I, I would just note that it is, uh, you know, an awful lot of different procedures that people aren't, um, uh, you know, really uh, may not understand. But in other in other respects, I, I really appreciate the, um, you know, the power of the reform. Um, so, Catherine, you want to respond to that? I want to get to Spencer Reynolds's question, but go ahead, Catherine. Well, uh, Frank is right. You know, the people of Papua New Guinea can do this and in all these other uh, places and here in Maine, which was an enormous accomplishment, by the way. Let me not say that because I now think we should go for final five voting. It wasn't like earth shattering in a good way that uh, Kara McCormick led led us to vict us, led people concerned about democracy in Mainers uh, to victory on RCV in Maine several years ago. So it's totally doable. It's something the opponents are gonna to use to try to have voters reject this system. But actually when in final five, when you have the combination of an open preliminary round where you just, everybody just picks one, that's pretty easy because you're not asking them to rank when there's a crowded field. And then when they only need to rank when there's five clear choices that they've heard a lot about between the preliminary round and the general, that's even, you know, again, it's not, it's not asking very much of them relative to even other places where they might have more candidates they need to rank. So in some, it's actually somewhat simpler than 
than instant runoffs as implemented other places. And there was a survey coming out of Alaska showing that uh, 80% of the people who voted said it was simple and 59% said it was very simple. Um, what, I think but here's actually... what we do. Let me say, Jeff, when we're going to make presentations to groups, our, the, one of the best things we do is when people come in to like the, the lunch, there's just a little uh, five person, you know, a general election yeah, ballot yeah. in front of them. And you don't give them any instructions. It just says on their rank and order of preference. And you tell them we're going to collect the cards when the meal starts. And everybody just picks up a pen and does it. And then your presentation goes so much better because they were able to do it with no instruction. They didn't know what you were there to talk about or anything. And then you say, like that thing you did when you came <laughs> No here. instructions. And right. They go, oh, okay. I mean, I think it's kind of fun to rank things. Um, okay. So let's move to Spencer. Question. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, wonderful. Uh, especially your focus on affecting behavior in office. That's really a uh, principle. So my question, hopefully not too arcane, I think in pulling this, uh, this uh, thread you've just been talking about is to briefly comment maybe on the number five and perhaps in contrast to the uh, perhaps even simpler uh, form of the top two system popularized in uh, California. Thank no. you. <laughs> Yeah. Larry, you know, let, let Larry comment uh, first and then Catherine, Please, because he's, he's there in California. Don't, don't inflict. And he loves it. Other state, <laughs> I beg you. Um, <laughs> yes, it solves the party primary problem, but not really very much, because in the end, in most of these districts, it, the top two are the same top Republican and top Democrat who would have gotten in otherwise. Occasionally, you'll get two Republicans or, or two Democrats running, and often it's like the pathetic race between uh, Sherman and Berman in L.A. when this first got adopted, when you just had two liberals slashing each other pointlessly in a, in a general election. Um, it, it just, it, you know, I, I'm not going to say top two in California has had no positive effect. I think it's had a very modest one, but what a waste of a reform opportunity uh, when you could actually use rank choice voting in a meaningful way in the general election. Um, I am, I, I, whatever Catherine said about the pointlessness uh, of um, having a more kind of modest rank choice voting reform, uh, I feel like, at a huge exponential level of passion about top two. Uh, Catherine, you want to you want to comment? Uh, it, yeah, well, I, I I agree so, with Barry there. Let me just say though, we I, we owe the states of California and the state of Maine, for example, trying these two pieces, because when I first heard of top two, I thought, oh my god, it couldn't be better than that, right? Just like when I heard of nonpartisan redistricting, I thought it couldn't be better than that. And it's over time when we can look at these pioneers of change and say, oh, now we found that if we combine them, we really get at that root cause of November voters having no say, and that that being the best place to, you know, uh, to change the system. Like, for example, we used to, a lot of us used to think that the answer was, let's just get more primary turnout. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, ding, ding, ding. How about we just change the decision point to the time when there already is turnout? And so it was like, oh, yeah, let's do that. You know, so we get better. Nobody, I mean, this was, we didn't have this optimized idea. And let me say, when there is a better idea, I'm going to drop final five voting like a hot potato and get on board with a new thing. But well, there, I don't think we're getting there. But you you did drop final four and went to final five, right? So actually, we only have four minutes, and 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 uh, I know we've got to end. Jeff has told me we've got to really end on time. So just explain uh, quickly, if you can, why five is the right number. Sure. Well, here's the thing: more competition is always better in increasing innovation and, um, and accountability 
in any kind of system. In general, more is better. But more stops being better as soon as the incremental, you know, increase of like one more candidate has the, the like the marginal increase of each candidate now has a has too much effect. I'm I'm saying this wrong, but on the downside, like the increase in the complexity. So the reason it's five is because more is better. You get lower barriers to entry, wider policy dialogue, uh, more competition, no more less of two evils, more accountability, more dimensions, all of that. But we can't go more than five because neuroscience tells us that the average human can hold five to seven things in their brain at one time. And because we are designing a system for all of us, we need to put the upper limit at five. So that's why you got to go more until neuroscience says enough. So what happened to my screen? It turned into like, okay, there we go. Um, so, and actually uh, Catherine writes more about this in the Journal of Constitutional Political Economy, just out. Uh, maybe that can go into chat if it's not there already. So you can check that out. You can also check out this concept of best winner, which is kind of, which is, I, th I find really interesting. Um, Larry, do you have any final comments? Um, well, yes, it's uh, mainly to thank American Purpose for organizing this and Catherine and her team. I see both Sylvie uh, and uh, uh, Dobelt and Kara McCormick on the call too, for the great work they're doing. Um, I, I just, the, the one substantive thing to add is I, I think we, we need to break the par two party duopoly. That's an underlying theme in Catherine's book uh, and just make American democracy more open, fluid and democratic. So, you know, the libertarian party is out there. The green party is out there. Another argument for going to the limits of neuroscience is we'll get, you know, with final five, we're more likely to get some candidates who won't be Republicans and Democrats. And, you know, if they're there in the final round, they'll get a hearing. If they've got better arguments, let them, you know, let them surface. Maybe some of them will start getting elected. Uh, and, you know, that could be good for American democracy, too. Catherine, uh, 30 okay, seconds. My final comment is who wants to watch a Super Bowl where you already know who's going to win? So if the media are actually looking for something exciting, they could actually cover competitive races. It would be amazing. Instead of just covering people bashing each other, they could cover, oh my goodness, who is really going to win? And people could engage in that. So we need a vibrant democracy for all the reasons Larry mentioned, and it will also be more engaging. Um, it has, I just have to say, oh my God, I cannot believe that I get to sort of in doing this work, be on the same podcast or web, webinar with people like Larry Diamond, Francis Fukuyama, Jim Glassman, and our host, Jeff Gedman. Thank you guys. It was like so great. Thank you, Catherine. And may, I, may I ask, I wanna thank, sorry to jump in, Jim. Um, sure. If you allow me, I'm gonna say thanks to you, Jim, and Larry and Sylvie. Thank you, Jim, for mentioning our late friend, Peter Ackerman. Uh, Kara, and your important work, thank you. Sylvie, thank you. And Catherine, we're over time. I have one question. You can answer it in 15 seconds or less. Ready? How do we purchase your coffee mug? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, there's no way to purchase it. If you really want one, you can email me at Catherine at CatherineGale.com. And because you are supporters of American Purpose, you will get this complimentary. And we will now update our website so you can buy them. We may fight you because we're going to make a contribution. Catherine, amazing work. Larry, Jim, everybody who's here, what a fabulous conversation. Jim, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm.